Hello, church. How are you? Hello, we are fine. Uh, we're going to pray so that we can start our singing session for this day. Let's stand up for a word of prayer. Shall we pray? Thank you, dear God, because of this evening that you brought us once again for the GYE week. I will pray that may you extend our brothers and sisters free to our coming so that you can be able to continue together. May you be with us even as we start this singing session. May you accept our worship, oh dear Lord, be even with our speaker of the day and let everything that you're going to do be for own and glory of your holy name. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Amen. So we will start by singing hymn number 184, Jesus Paid It All, 184. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now in find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's sports and melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all all to him I owe see a crimson stain he washed it white as snow since nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim I'll wash my garment white in the blood of Calvary's lamb, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, I'll lay my trophies down, all down at Jesus' feet. Jesus paid it all, all crimson stain he washed it white as snow amen and our next hymn is hymn number 287 softly and tenderly Jesus is calling 287 Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. At the heart's portal, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Honestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O oh sinner, 
should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Honestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, come home. Of the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have seen he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Number 307, I am coming to the cross. 307. Humbly 
me, Jesus, save me now. Amen. We plead to him that he may save us so that one day we may enjoy sitting with him in heaven. Thank you. And all the time, I couldn't hear that. Let's do it again. God is good. And all the time, oh, thank you so much. Um, shall we all stand? Let us stand. Shall we pray? Our God and Father who art in heaven, we thank you for bringing us this evening. Father, as we continue with the week of prayer, we pray that you send the Holy Spirit to be amongst us, and that, Lord, you speak to the speaker, that everything that he's going to say will come from above. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to welcome all of you who have come today in time, and we would also like to welcome our online viewers uh, to begin our program this evening uh, let me just um, introduce the the puppet team we have Lois Ayondo and then we we'll also have um, Lois Ayondo is going to give us the the text and also the the, the theme song and then Edna is going to Edna Nyakundi is going to give us the, um, the special songs. Then we will have um, our pastor, Pastor Colin Mapa, is the one going to give us the bread of life. Um, then we'll have a prayer session after the, the service, after the sermon, uh, which will be done by Jarius Mutuku. And then... Um, our interpreter is Anne Msomi. That's our interpreter there. Thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening once more. Um, we'll read our scripture reading. Our key text comes from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 34, from verse 1 to 10. I'll be reading from King James Version. It says, And Moses went up from the plains of Moab and to the mountain of Naboth, to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees unto Zohar. And the Lord and the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham and to Isaac. And unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, over against, against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulture unto this day. And Moses was an hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. So the days of weeping 
and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And, and there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Um, the preacher will expound more on that. I'll now call upon the choristers to take us through our theme song. Hymn number 612. Shall we kneel down for prayer?
Our God and Father who art in heaven, we thank you that you've brought us again this evening to listen to your word. Father, in the name of Jesus, there are so many things that may have happened to us during the day, during the week that has just begun, but we pray, Lord, that you forgive us our sins. Father, in the name of Jesus, as the preacher is going to come to pray, to preach with us and to talk to us, I want to pray that you be with him, be with his ministry, and be with his family. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to also pray for the people watching online, that, Lord, you will touch them, because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. all. Um, I'd like to welcome Esther Nyabuto for a special item. Thereafter, our Pastor Colin will come in for the sermon. Thank you. God is good. And all the time. My heart is so proud my mind is so unfocused i see the things you do through me as great things i have done and now you gently break me then lovingly you take me and hold me as my father and hold me as my maker I ask you how many times will you pick me up When I keep on letting you down And each time I will fall short of your glory How far will forgiveness abound And you answer my child, I love you and as long as you're seeking my face You walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace At times I may grow weak And feel a bit discouraged Knowing that someone somewhere could do a better job For who am I to serve you? I know I don't deserve you And that's the part that burns in my heart And keeps me hanging on I ask you how many times do you pick me up When I keep on letting you down And each time I will fall short of your glory How far will forgiveness abound And you answer my child, I love you And as long as you seek in my face Walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace You are so patient with me, Lord As I walk with you, I'm learning What your grace really means the price that I could never pay 
was paid at Calvary. So instead of trying to repay you, I'm learning to simply obey you by giving all my heart to you for all that you've given to me. I ask you how many times do you pick me keep on letting you down and each time I will fall short of your glory how far will forgiveness abound and you answer my child I love you and as long as you're seeking my face you walk in the path of my daily sufficient grace. It is good to be here. We thank God for the gift of life and for your presence, all of you. We hope that today the Lord is going to speak to us and that we may be refreshed and be revived in his word. Um, our text has been read, but you will allow me to read it again so that I can also have it in my head. We are reading from... Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 through to 10. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mount of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah, unto the utmost sea, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, and the city of palm trees, unto Zohar. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with your eyes, but you will not go over. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knows of his sepulchre unto this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim nor his natural force abetted. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For, the, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse number 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Allow me to speak to you on the subject, something better. Something better. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit, for without him, this can turn out to be a waste of time for your people. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So we just read from the book of uh, Deuteronomy. The book begins with a reflection on a past of which Moses was a part of. When you start from the very first verse of the very first chapter, it's a reflection of the past. And in this past, Moses was an active agent. But when it comes to an end, it ends with another reflection. But this reflection is on a future in which Moses will have no part. The first reflection, Moses was a part of it. And when he is reflecting on the future, what is going to become the, of the children of God? How are they going to settle in their promised land? Moses did not participate in that future. And this is the reality of life. We come by birth, we live, and we die. Solomon says, the living know that they shall die. You see, when they are writing on, 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 on the tombstone, what they do is they put two deaths. The death of your birth and the death of your death. And in between, they put a hyphen. And that's your whole life. <laughs> that's your whole life. And before the judgment bar of God, you have to account for that dash. Is there someone in the church? That dash in between those two dates, you need to take care of it. You need to use it wisely. As a husband, make use of that day, that dash there. That's your whole life. As a wife, make use of that hyphen. That's your whole life. And when it comes to an end, when your life comes to an end, and people think of you, they are sitting in the lounge, and your frame is there on the wall. When they look at that picture, what is going to come to their minds about you? And this is the moment to make the records right. Are we together, church? You are the boss where you work. What are your employees going to say when the other debt is written on your tombstone? Will they say it's a loss or they will say good riddance? And when you study the life of Moses in this chapter, you will notice that God made an evaluation of the life of Moses. So as the book begins, it begins with a reflection, it ends with another reflection. And in this topic, in this chapter, we have two people. Rather, we have God and we have Moses as the main characters in the chapter. So let's talk about God. Verse number four. And the Lord said unto him, God is talking to Moses. This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto your seed. Right there, we see a God who keeps his promises. Way back in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, that's when the, that was the first time when the promise was made to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. And now we are talking about some 600 years later, God has fulfilled his promise. And I want to say to someone here, congratulations, you worship a God who keeps his promises. Congratulations, you worship a God who remembers his covenant. He makes a promise to you, even when you are dead, you can be rest assured that you will keep it to your children. That's the kind of God we worship. You see, our frustration with God comes not from the fact that God fails to keep his promises, because he never fails. But our frustration comes in expecting God to keep a promise that he never made. You expect God to do what he never said he would do. And that's where your frustration comes from. God never promised a young lady that if you snatch someone's husband, you're going to be happy. He never did that. And neither did he promise an unfaithful spouse that they will live a happy life. He never promised that. But everything that the Lord has promised, he makes sure that it comes to pass. You will be excited to know that when the children of Israel were being taken out of the promised land, the book of Jeremiah chapter 27, God promised the vessels of the temple 
that you are going to Babylon, but I'll bring you back. He promised the vessels, not the people only, also the vessels. And when you study Ezra chapter 1, verse 7 to 11, God made sure that the vessels came back. Oh my God. So if he can keep promises to pieces of furniture, how about the person he created? If he can keep promises to pieces of furniture, how about a person for whom Christ died on the cross? So our God is a covenant-keeping God. Just don't expect him to do what he never said he would do because then you will be very frustrated. The second character in this chapter is Moses. And Moses is in this chapter, he is portrayed as the servant of God, whom God encouraged, equipped, disciplined, and replaced. I want you to take note of that. No one is indispensable in the mission of God. God moves people around for his mission and for his glory. And here we find Moses being replaced by Joshua. But you need to also understand that at the outset, Moses was an imperfect vessel, resistant to God's call, and on occasion hot-headed and reckless in the performance of duty, and sometimes frustrated with the people that he was leading. That was Moses. But you need to understand that the grace of God turned him around and made him a perfect vessel for the mission of God. It does not matter where you have been, whom you have been, but when you are in Christ, you are a new creature and God can use you for his glory. There are people who sit in church and they say, my past is bad. Your past is a good sermon to someone. Let me tell you that. Your past that past which you say it's filthy. You sit someone down and you tell them where God has taken you from and where you are now. They will see the glory of the Lord. Sometimes mission is not successful because we try to be superficial. Tell people what the Lord has done to you. That's the biggest sermon you can ever preach. And so Moses is told in verse number four, you are not crossing over. We are going to our sermon title. Bear with me for a moment. You are not crossing over. You are not going. Now, how did we come to this? How come the Exodus soldier is no longer going or making it into the promised land? He is right at the border and he can see the land, but he is not getting over. How come? If you're going to understand the reason, you need to revisit Numbers chapter 20. What happens in Numbers chapter 20? People are in a desert called the desert of Zin. And there people run out of water. They are in a desert. They run out of water. And then the people come to Moses and Aaron and they begin murmuring and complaining. You brought us out here to kill us. Rather, you take us back to Egypt. And so Moses and Aaron went before the Lord. They cried before the Lord. And God gave a specific instruction. What did he say? Take your rod, call people, and speak to the rock. Do you hear the instruction? Take your rod, call people to gather. And when they are gathered, you are going to speak to the rock. And so Moses does that. But in fury and in anger, he says, must we fetch water out of this rock for you? Read that part correctly. Must we? So Moses is now part of the Godhead. He can now bring water out of the rock. Danger number one. Danger number two, instead of speaking to the rock, he strikes the rock twice. And when you look at this issue, you think, ah, but this is a small thing. God, how can you be so hard on Moses? Just because he struck the rock instead of talking to it, and now you are punishing him by not allowing him to step on the promised land. How can you be so hard? But here was the problem. This rock was Christ. Huh? Exodus chapter 17, there was a problem of water. And he struck the rock and water came out. This time he must speak to the rock. And so Ellen White says, when he struck the rock the first time, 
He was pointing to the crucifixion of Christ on the cross. Strike. But then striking it again, he was now preaching a wrong message to say Christ was going to be crucified twice. Ah. So the crime that Moses committed was to preach the wrong gospel. Christ died once, he is not going to die again. If you study 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you will be told by Paul that people drank water from the rock that followed them. Have you ever come across that text? People were drinking from the rock that followed them. So this rock was Christ. So when he struck the rock the first time, he was pointing to the death of Christ on the cross. And now he was just supposed to speak just as much as we are expected to speak to God and he gives us blessings. And because of that, God said to Moses, you and Aaron, you are not crossing over. You are not going. And from there, that very chapter, Aaron died. At the end of that chapter, Aaron died. There are two lessons I want us to pick from this. Number one, God is very particular. He wants things done the way he has instructed them to be done. Do I have a witness in this church? You need to understand that it was one wrong act that stopped Moses from making it into the promised land. One, that of striking instead of speaking. So if you know what the Lord has said, you are safe if you do it exactly the way he has said it. Because then we say you are obedient. Are we together, church? Lesson number one. Lesson number two, never assume that the conquered sins of yesterday have no more power to take you down. Don't assume that. Let me take that again. You didn't hear me. Never assume that the conquered sins of yesterday have no power to take you down. What am I talking about? It was the anger and the impatience of Moses that made him to strike the rock instead of speaking, it, speaking to it. But what happened? Let's look at Moses for a moment. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 to 12, you see that kind of a Moses. Impatient, violent, a fighter. A, a man who has no time to waste. He goes to see his relatives. He sees a Hebrew fighting against an Egyptian. He kills the Egyptian by himself, buries the man by himself. That's the Moses of Exodus chapter 2. But then he is taken to the land of Midian, and there he learns the humility of Christ by heading the sheep of his father-in-law. And when you come to Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible tells you there is no man who was as meek as Moses. Transformation. Have you seen the transformation from a man who is impatient, from a man who is rash, who is violent, who is, who is full of rage, and now he is a meek man. Compared to all other men of his time, no one was as meek as Moses. He has changed. But when you come to Numbers chapter 20, the Moses of Exodus chapter 2 has resurrected. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to teach myself to enjoy myself here. The, the Moses of Exodus has resurrected, but we have the Moses of Numbers who is quiet, calm, long-suffering, enduring, who is patient, but the Moses of Exodus chapter 2 rose from the dead. So I'm saying he had conquered this sin of impatience. He had conquered this sin of anger. He had conquered the sin of rage. But that sin of yesterday brought him down and he did not make it into the promised land. You need to be careful of the conquered sins of yesterday. Families have died because a man thought he has overcome adultery, but it came again and destroyed his marriage. Be careful of the sins of yesterday. Somebody lost a job. They embezzled funds once, caught, forgiven, and they thought they have overcome. But just recently, the, te the contract was terminated for the same sin that came back again. Be careful of the sins of yesterday. They are dangerous. Be careful of the sins of yesterday. So because of that sin, Moses was dis denied entry into the promised land. Oh, how disappointed he was. You need to understand that this is the man brought up in the house of Pharaoh, led away into the land of the Midian, followed there by God, brought back 
You need to understand that the life of Moses is divided into three forties. The first 40 in Egypt, the second 40 in Midian, and the other 40 leading the children of Israel to the promised land. That's the long and short of the, of the life of Moses. But you need to understand that after investing 40 years of his life, thinking he would also set his foot on the promised land, right at the verge of it, God says, you're not going in. I want you to put on his shoes for a moment. Just how he felt. Time and again, you will notice that he was told, you are going to view the land, but you're not going to set your foot on it. You're going to view the land, but you're not going to set your foot on it. Let's read together. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 23 to 27. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 23 to 27. Let's hear Moses begging, asking God to allow him to go into the promised land. And I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O oh Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness, your mighty hand, for what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to your works and according to thy might. I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain and Lebanon. This was the request of Moses, but here came the response. The Lord was angry angry with me for your sake and would not hear me and the lord said unto me let it suffice thee enough of this i don't want to hear you talking to me about this anymore you are not going to the promised land who else was told this by god paul he pleaded with god three times the thorn in his flesh, until God said, don't talk to me about this issue anymore i have made a decision and i will stick by it Chapter 32, verse 52. We just want to follow portions where Moses pleaded with God. In chapter 32, verse 52, we read the response of God. Yet you shall see the land before you, but you will not go in. And chapter 34, verse 4, you will see the land, but you will not go in. Now, you need to understand that there are moments in this life when the God you love and the God who loves you will have to say no to what you really want. Ah. Moses so desires to make it into the promised land, but God is saying no. No. And this is what he was waiting to do all this while. I can picture Moses after a long day at work, you know, resolving conflicts, judging people, doing this and that. His pillow talk with Zipporah would be, don't worry, my husband, soon you will be in the promised land. But alas, God says no. God says no. There are moments in our lives when God will say no. This is unpleasant to hear, but it's the reality. In this life, the God who loves you will have to say no to some of your requests. I have seen people standing by the bedside of their sick relatives, praying over their health. But as soon as they say amen, the person breathes this last. God saying no. I've seen that happen. I've seen it happen. Someone praying that God may give him a year or so to put his things in order while working at that place. But God can say no. To the very things that you really want, God can say no. I've seen people praying, fasting, that they may become academics, high achievers, but it just doesn't happen. There are moments when God says no. God is able to do these things. He can fix things for you. He can give you a job. He can make your marriage work. He can, all these things, he can bring you back to good health. But there are moments when God says no. And those moments are dangerous to the safety of your spirituality. People have left the church because at some point in their life, God said no. And they made a shipwreck of their faith. This is unpleasant to hear, I know. But you need to know that the moments when God says no to what you really want, you need to remember that it's a no from a loving father. Did someone hear me? It's a no from a loving father. You need to remember that this God who is saying no to you gave you Jesus as a gift in the first place. And if he gave you Jesus as a gift, 
then he cannot deny you the good of this earth if it is good for you. He won't. But there are things that we ask for from God that are harmful to our spirituality. And God says, no. And this is the moment where you must pray the prayer that Jesus made. Let not my will, <laughs> but thine be done. This is a, it's a very delicate issue. There is a war that rages within your heart. Especially when your will is going against God's and you know it. Huh? <laughs> you know for sure that my business has taken a nose diving direction. Your will is to resuscitate it. But God's will is that you don't give a bribe. Right there, there is a war in your heart. But it is at this moment when the person who is not a nominal Christian must go down on their knees and say, let not my will but thine be done. This is the moment where you must sing, have thine own way, O Lord. <laughs> have thine own way. I am the clay and you are the potter. In your head, that's where the shape of what I must be is. Not in me, the clay, but it's in the mind of the potter. So the clay cannot tell the potter what he must do with his clay. Have thine own way, O Lord. This is the moment where we must sing, for I know whatever befalls me. <laughs> Jesus doeth all things well. Walking in the valley of death, but trusting God, for there is a path to walk on. There are moments in life when God says no. So the hope that for 40 years had lighted up the darkness of the desert wanderings had been denied. The wilderness grave was the goal of those years of toil and hard burdening care for Moses. Moses is dying, having not achieved the goal that obsessed him. He was so obsessed about taking the children of Israel into the promised land, him presiding over the dividing of the land. God, you will stay here. Naphtali, you're going to stay there. Judah, your place is there. But he died just after seeing the land, but not testing it. So when God says no, it is grace in action. I said, <laughs> when God says no, it's grace in action. You know when this curtain is removed and Jesus is standing on your side and you are asking him, but why is it I was 30 and the young man who approached him, he had to be the one. God, I was 30. And then God will open the curtain and show you the pit that you were just about to fall in. You will say, God, you are wiser. You will thank God for the decisions that he made that you were not happy with. Trust God. And God will take care of you. And so we see Moses now. Verse number one tells us that he went up. He went up from the plains of Moab. He went up on the Moabite plateau. It was a range of mountains called Pisgah. And the highest point of that mountain was the one that was called Nebo. 2,600 feet above sea level. Some say 2,740 feet above sea level. And Ellen White says, he turned his back on the congregation. Having addressed them, having prepared them for the promised land, he turned his back and in silence and alone, he made the 2,600 feet to Mount Nebo. I'm about to get to the sermon title now. I need you to enjoy this with me. And so when he got there, what does the Bible say? And the Lord showed him, verse number one. The Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah, unto the utmost sea, and the south, and the plain, and the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zohar. Pause, reflect. The children of Israel have not yet crossed the Jordan River. But Moses has been showed the land of God. Ah. What is God doing? He took Moses from the present and he threw him into the future. And he said, I'm going to show you what you would have seen would you have been alive. God is good. And so he tells him, this is where God will be. You're going to be dead, but God is going to stay there. 
<laughs> and Naphtali is going to stay there. And Ephraim, Manasseh, they are going to be there. So God gave him a glimpse of the future. But you need to understand that some of these lands that he is being shown are about a hundred miles away from Pisgah. And there is no naked eye that can see clearly something that's a hundred miles away. So it's either God gave Moses an extraordinary vision or he zoomed the land in. <laughs> God zoomed the land. Say, Moses, my servant, this is the end of your trip. You are dying here. You see, Moses was used to telling others that this is now your dying day. He was used to that. He's the one who told Miriam, hey, my sister, you're dying. And he told Aaron, Aaron, we are going up the mountain, but I'm coming back alone. You are dying. But this time, he is on the mountain all by himself, reminiscing, reflecting on where God took him and where he is, but just how tragic his life is ending. And so God said, no, Moses, I have something better for you. Before you die, let me show you what I intend to do with the people you left down there. And so God shows him the land, the entire land, in a panoramic counterclockwise direction. He was shown the entire land of Israel and how they were going to settle in there. And the narrator of Deuteronomy chapter 34 ends there. But Ellen White picks the narration up. Oh my God. This is where I enjoy myself. Patriarchs and Prophets chapter 34. The chapter is called The Death of Moses. If you have not read this, Please don't sleep tonight. You will be doing yourself a whole lot of injustice. Just go and read it. It's short and it's a bit long, but you will enjoy it. So, as soon as Moses was shown the land, the narrator of the Bible tells us in verse 5, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. But Ellen White comes in between verse 4 and verse 5, and he, she tells us what God showed Moses as he was standing on Mount Nebo. And so he saw, he was shown, and he saw the chosen people established in Canaan, sitting there, staying, enjoying the milk, enjoying the vines, enjoying the grapes. And then he, the future came rolling in front of him, and he saw them being dispersed from the promised land because of disobedience. And from there, he was shown the first advent of the Savior. He saw Jesus being born while on Pisgah. God showed him all that, and he, showed the, he saw the humble life of Christ, and he saw the final rejection of Israel when they stoned Stephen to death. He saw all that while he was sitting on Mount Nebo, and from there, he followed the Savior to get some money, and when he saw the Savior in Gethsemane bleeding for the sins of the world, and he saw just Jesus being buried in Joseph's tomb, and he saw him rising from the grave. And from there, he saw Jesus being escorted by angels going back to heaven. But together with Jesus, there is an evidence that's following him that Jesus has become victor over death. Evidence that he has conquered death. And right there, he was shown that when Jesus gets to the pearly gates, you, Moses, are the one who's going to open these gates for Christ. Ah. Oh, this is happening on Pisgah. And God is comforting his servant. And when Moses saw that, okay, I'm the one who's going to open the gates for Christ. Ellen White says his heart was filled with relief. And he was ready to die. And this is the moment when Psalm 24 was fulfilled. What does Psalm 24 say? Lift up your heads, O he gets, that the king of glory may enter. Who is the king of glory? It is Jesus Almighty who has conquered in battle. And the psalm it says it's not enough to say it just once. Lift up your heads, O he gets, that the king of glory may enter. Who is this king of glory? It is the Lord God Almighty who has overcome in battle. And so Moses sees himself opening the pearly gates that Christ and the few redeemed may enter. And he went all the way until he was seen the new Jerusalem. And when he saw the new Jerusalem, Ellen White says that scene faded. 
And like a tired warrior, he laid down to rest. And that was the end of Moses' life. But fast forward with me now to Jude chapter 9. Fast forward with me. What happens in Jude 9? In Jude 9, there is a dispute over the body of Moses. Jesus himself came down. It was Jesus and the angels who dug the grave of Moses and buried him on Mount Nebo. And it was him who came down to resurrect him. And right there on his body, there was a dispute. Why? The devil was claiming this man did not make it to the promised land because he had sinned against you. You cannot resurrect this man. But in not wanting to descend into the arguments, Jesus simply said, may the Lord rebuke you. And he called Moses back to life and he took him to heaven. Why did he do that? He was preparing him to receive Christ when he comes back to heaven from winning people on earth. Fast forward, Luke chapter 9. What happens in Luke chapter 9? Something better. What happens in Luke chapter 9? Come with me to the book of Luke chapter 9. Let's read that portion together. This is the Mount of Transfiguration. Verse 28 says, And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, Jesus took Peter, John, and James, and they went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his, his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, they talked with him two men. <laughs> and one of them is Moses. I wish I had a witness in this church. Two men visit Jesus. Jesus is on earth. Moses is in heaven. And God says, the man who is carrying the sins of the world on earth is getting tired. We need those who came from earth to go and give him some energy. Who will go for us? Elijah shows up. And God says, Elijah, you are representing those who are going to make it to heaven without testing death. But you, you, you cannot really strengthen this man because this man must first die. So we need someone who went through the experience of death and tested resurrection. He is the one who can strengthen this man better. Who will go? Moses shows up. Representing those who make it to heaven after having tested death. Now I want you to see what's happening. I want to give you three things that were better. Number one, Moses was supposed to make it into the promised land on foot. Had he not died, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, he was supposed to make it into Canaan on, but this time around, he shows up from outer space. Ah. What's better, walking or flying, or whatever he did to come? Something better. Moses died on the mount, but he trusted God with his life. I don't know if he knew that God was preparing something better for him. But his disappointment, trusting God in his disappointment, made him to enjoy something better than what he would have enjoyed had he walked to Canaan on foot. Let me give you another one. The second thing that was better. Moses was supposed to make it to the promised land in a body that dies. A body that faces corruption and clothes that would start decaying as soon as they got into the promised land. But watch him come this time. His body is radiant. What's better, a body that dies or a body that will not corrupt? God was simply preparing Moses for something better. Let's talk about this radiance for a moment. There is a time that Moses went up the mountain. And when he came down, only his face was shining. And he had to veil his face so that he could speak to the people. But this time around, it's not just the face that is radiant. It's the entire body. Something better. Oh, let's talk about the clothes. <laughs> Maybe he was wearing something white when he died. No problem. But this time he's coming down. He's wearing this shiny white garment that's more white than the daylight something better let me give you last thing <laughs> when moses 
was leading the children of Israel to Canaan. He was the one who was walking on foot while Jesus was up in the sky. Huh? But this time they have traded places. Uh. Now Moses is in heaven and Jesus is walking on foot. They have traded places. He has been given the opportunity to strengthen, give strength to the creator. Something better. Right now, I'm talking to you, you have a disappointing life that you are leading. Something is not right and God is just not fixing it. When things are like that, wait on God. He is creating something better for you. God is creating something better. God does not enjoy watching you suffer. No, that's not him. But if he allows you to go through difficult times, he is saying, wait on me, my child. I am creating something better for you. I know what happened. That young man had given you a ring to book a place in, in your heart. And he stopped all other young boys to come. They said, ah, this one is engaged, this one. Let her be. But then you were shocked. You received an invitation card to a wedding that you were supposed to invite people to. And your heart was broken. Well, let me tell you something. God was preparing something better for you. Even if right now you are still in waiting, wait upon God. He is brewing something better. I know your health is failing you. And God is the healer, you know. We sing, the great physician now is he. He is the great physician. But there are moments when the great physician decides not to be for you. But if he does that, you need to understand. He is creating something better. Let me tell a little truth. There are three instances when God can heal. Three that I've seen so far in the Bible. He can heal immediately. We come to your house, or you, no, nobody wants to be sick. You come to my house to pray for me. Having been bedridden for five years, as soon as you're done praying, my brother, I can say, let, let me see you to the gate. God has healed me instantly. God can do that. Or I can then call you to say, hey, my brother, two weeks later, I am better now. I'm actually walking about doing my garden. God can heal a little bit later. Now, this one, people don't like it. God can also heal at resurrection. He will allow you to rest, creating something better for you. Let me tell you what's better about that. When you rise from the grave, your body will be nicer than that of Christ. Ah. There's a song we sing back home. It goes something like this. When we get to heaven, we are going to see Jesus with the scars in his hands. He's going to carry those scars forever. But your body will be more beautiful than his. No scar, no scratch, nothing. So what is God doing while you are staying in your disappointment? He is preparing something better. Your job was terminated. Okay. You didn't do anything wrong. You know, there are people who have this system of digging up their own Red Seas and then they cry, hey, I can't cross, but you dug your own Red Sea. But there are moments when you see the Red Sea right before you. God has led you there. He is preparing something better for you. I don't know what you are going through and I don't know where your disappointment lies. It could be in health. It could be in economics. It could be socially. It could be financially. It could be your family. I don't know what it is. But if God is allowing it, then he has a better plan than the one you have in your head. I want to encourage you to wait on God. Wait on God. So verse number 10 says, Moses was a big man. Why was he a big man? Because the Lord knew him face to face. Huh? The Lord knew, not that Moses knew the Lord. Huh? The Lord knew. There is a difference between knowing God and being known by God. Ah. <laughs> I'm told by the Gospels that there is a time when people who will be lost will come to Christ and say, we prophesied in your name. We drove out demons in your name. 
We took care of the hungry in your name. We visited prisons in your name. But the response of Christ is this. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So it's not that you need to know God and it's okay. God must know you. For you to experience all this, God must know you. And when you pray tonight, pray that God knows you. But I want to pray with someone tonight who is saying, I am standing between a hard place and a rock. It's a bitter disappointment for me in my life. Where I am, it's not palatable. I don't want to be here. And I've prayed to God over and over about this. Well, I've got news for you. God is preparing something better. Don't move away from your God, or else that blessing will find you off position. But I want to pray with you. If you are there and you are saying, Lord, teach me to wait until you show me this thing that's better, rise to your feet and we pray together. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ the royal master leads against the foe. Forward into battle, see his banner go. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross Jesus going on before. You could be here, and you want a special prayer. I want to give you this opportunity, as we'll be singing the second stanza, or whatever stanza will come to our heads. Just come to the front, so that we can pray together. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all oh, one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Crowns and thrones have perished, kingdoms rise and wed, but the church of Jesus Constant will remain. Gates of hell can never against this church prevail. We have God's own promise that can never fail. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. May God bless you. We are going to pray that while you are waiting for God to come through for you, you learn to trust him. Learn to wait. One musician said, while we wait, we might have to stand in the rain. And while we wait... Our friends may not be by our side. But while we're waiting for the promise to be fulfilled in our lives, we need to remember this. God is never late. So praise him while you wait. I'm going to pray um, right now. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne. Thanking you for the life of Moses. And for the revelation that you gave to him that can be our source of encouragement today. Things are not well. But you have given us this gem of truth. That when we see you as if you're not acting on our issues. 
you are busy preparing something better. Oh Lord, how I pray for my brothers and my sisters and my parents in this church that you may give them the strength to wait. Waiting is never easy. But if we fix our eyes on you and keep this truth in our hearts that you are preparing something better, yes, we can praise you while we wait. We have come to the front, our different age groups. Some are online. They could not come to the front, but Lord, you see their hearts. How I pray that you attend to their needs. Give them the gift of patience, the gift of endurance, forbearance, as we wait for you to hand over to us something better. I pray that you may give them a peace that surpasses all understanding. A peace that only you can give. A peace that is not governed by outward circumstances. You don't have this, you don't have that. But a peace that comes through the presence of Christ in our hearts. And so while we wait, we pray that you come through for us with something better. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Good evening, church. Uh, it's time for congregational prayer. So we will be grouping to groups of two, or rather three. You can share with your friend. I request that you'd like them to help you pray, with, pray for. Maybe for two or three minutes, and then after that, we'll crown with a prayer from this side. We regroup into three, if it's possible.
Okay, uh, let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come again before you. We know you never tire to listen to the prayers of your children. And we continue to bring our burdens and our cares before you. Praying that you may attend to each and every issue that has been put on paper and has been thrown into this box. People may never know, but you know what has been said to you through these papers by your children. Some of these papers are filled with tears. Some of these papers, it's been a long time since they've been writing and putting in this box. But we pray that tonight, you may create testimonies for us that may encourage us as we wait if we know that amongst us the Lord is moving, then we know he's in the neighborhood. He will pass by someday. Make testimonies for us that we may hold on to because of this prayer session. Hezekiah did this once. He brought a letter to the pulpit. And that very night, you sent a destroying angel and he dealt with the enemies of your children. How I pray that you may do the same for your people that our faith in you may continue to grow. You are a loving God. You care for us. You are always there for us. You will always provide for us. If you gave us Jesus on the cross, there is no way you can deny us the good things of this earth if they are good for us. Pray that you may help us and grant us these requests. For all this we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, after that, we'll now do our closing song, uh, 612, The Help of the Choristers. Christian soldiers marching us to 
We are praying, our Father and our God who art in heaven. Thank you for guiding us. Thank you for speaking, for speaking to us in a special way. Lord, even as we will be waiting, we have the hope that we'll be, we are waiting for something better. Be with us, Lord, even as we'll be dispersing from this place. Keep us safe and sound until we meet again tomorrow. For it is in the mighty name of our, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we are praying. May the grace and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.